right, so we have that portion being, so, so when I do these problems, and, and we obviously we know we're in this situation. If this were like maybe a question on like a final or something like that, and you've got multiple chapters and multiple concepts kind of all interacting, maybe this isn't the the first thing that you would recognize or or think about, but we know we're in chapter seven. We're dealing with this uh, concept all by itself, nothing else. So we know that those are the three segments that we're visualizing or trying to deal with as geometric means, right? Uh, so I'm going to, my, my attention is just drawn to those initially. Um, and I'm going to try to see if one of them is defined um, so that I can put it in those geometric means locations. So the one that is defined is the X plus 17. So that is, if you remember, that's the interior altitude. So that becomes then ge the geometric mean between that distance and that distance. Okay, remember, if that, that kind of gives you that shape of a T here, right? Um, so I'm going to put X here, and I'll put 68. Okay. Um, when I cross multiply, I get 68x. When I cross multiply here, I get x squared plus then this will be 34x's. And 17 times 17 is 289. Okay. Now, and, and this is, you know, we're trying to. This is beating the algorithm again. Um, eventually, or we could maybe recognize this. Everybody would have a number. Everybody's, when we FOIL here, obviously that's going to give me a perfect square of like 289. Um, the way this 68 is set up is that this 68 is always going to be four times as big as that number right there. If we go back in the algorithm and look at it, okay? Um, and the reason for that is because now when I when I subtract zero here, we get x squared minus 34x plus 289. What they were trying to do as a programmer was say, okay, try to generate something here for them that they can easily factor. Okay. Well, two numbers that multiply together give me 289, but add up to give me negative 34. We've already seen that here. Didn't 17 times 17 give me 289? And doesn't 17 plus 17 give me 34? So the only difference is that they've got to be both negative now, right? Because it's negative 34. So those are my two factors, x minus 17 and x minus 17. Now, to find those, again, like if you struggle with your factors, um, my suggestion is just to grab... Excel, or you can do this on TIE 384 as well. Um, and I'm going to type in, I'm just going to create a quick table here of values that go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I'm going to drag them down. You can type them in. There, there's shortcuts to doing that. Uh, and then I'm just going to type in here equals 289. And I'm going to divide it then by what is in that cell right there and hit enter. And I can scroll down. And what this is doing then is it took 289 and divided by 1 and gave me 289, right? Took 289 divided by 2, and I see that 289 divided by 2 is 144.5. So those two numbers right now, multiply them together, give me 289, right? So essentially I'm finding factors of 289. Now those were, that we want normally... Uh, based off definition, it's called that a factor of 289 because it's not a whole number. So if I scroll down, we see the ones that are whole numbers, those are the ones that are factors of 289. So those then are the two that we're going to look for because those add up to 34. Does that kind of make sense? Um, that's just kind of demonstrate this real quick. This is what you guys have, have you guys ever used Excel at all, like create like a, a roster or to organize information? Um, that's the way a lot of people use Excel that way just to organize things. Um, but it's actually, it, yeah, it's a giant calculator with, and it's a, it's a programmable calculator, meaning I can make it do 
if I'm savvy enough with my mathematics, I can make it do what I want it to do. Okay. So I'm just going to create, I'm just going to write list here. Uh, I'm going to put, um, we'll just say term that we're trying to factor. We'll put that there. Actually, we'll do this. Say factor, factor, term equals. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to grab those, and I can track, drag this as far as I want. So I'm just going to go down to 100. I probably shouldn't need anything more than that uh, when I'm trying to figure out factors of uh, numbers, okay, uh, at least at our level. Let's say the term we want, like we wanted 289, right? Okay. Uh, so this is the nice thing about um, Excel. I'm going to color those. I'm going to color those. Uh, but basically what I'm going to say is I want in this box right here, I want it to take the 289 and divide it by that right there. Okay, so it's going to take whatever's in D1 and divide it by whatever's in A2 and hit enter. Okay, and 289 divided by 1 should give me 289. Now, what I, because I'm going to copy this formula, and what I always want to divide that 289. So the way I've got to do that with Excel, they got to put those money signs, dollar signs around the D so that it tells it to always reference this cell right here. Okay, kind of show you what it does. If I don't do that, if I don't do that and I drag this down, it just gives me a bunch of zeros because what it's doing right now, if I double click, you see how it highlights the two things that are being divided. It highlights this one here and that one there. Well, if I go to this cell, see how it highlights the two things that are being divided. Okay. So when I dragged that stuff down, basically what it did is it dragged all the way down, it's dragging this one down, but it's also dragging this column down. So as it goes down in this next cell, it's going to go down in this next one and keep going. I don't want it to do that. I want it to stay stationary at 289. So in here, I got to put those, and it's called referencing, uh, but we've got to reference to 289 all the time. And now when I drag that down, Each one of the double click on it, you see it's highlighting the 289 and the 3. So it's doing what I want it to do. Now, the nice thing about this, because you're going to see another question here in a minute that maybe asks us not, not to do 289, but maybe does 625. So now I hit 625, hit enter. You see all those values change. So now I, I've developed essentially a calculator for us to find the factors of any number that we want to. Um, and it will change instantaneously. Does that make sense? And those of you that, if you've ever got online and, and you've Googled, like, uh, I'm assuming that we've all probably done this, like, um, like conversion calculator or something like that, okay? Uh, in the background of how those things, you guys see just the user face, okay? Um, so you just see, you know, the things you want to type in and the things you want to get to. You type your values in, you hit enter, and it spits numbers back to you. Well, in the background, it's being conducted somewhat like this, okay? Um, but my suggestion, if, if you're a person that struggles with finding those factors or it's a task that you want to quicken, maybe you build one of these quickly, um, save it to your desktop, and then you've got that for uh, future problems, okay? Um, but once we have that, so x equals 17, or x minus 17 uh, times x minus 17 equals zero, then x minus 17 should equal zero and we get x equals 17. It's a unique case uh, when you guys talk about um, algebra 1, algebra 2. When we have, does anybody remember the graph of this, what that kind of graph looks like? Like if it's x to the first, the graph is always a line, right? x squared, does anybody remember what we call that graph? Something like this. Anybody remember that? That's a parabola. Okay, so x squared minus 34x plus 289 is going to be a parabola that has moved away. It's been moved left and right, up and down. Uh, let's go find it. I'm going to zoom out. Right there it is. And 
the unique thing about it is that number right there is 17. Is that the 17 we just found as an answer? Okay. And the reason for that is whenever we solve an equation, we are solving the left-hand side. So our equation was y equals x squared minus, or sorry, 0 equals x squared minus 34x plus 289. When I solve an equation graphically, I take the left-hand side, which would have been the x squared minus 34x plus 289, and I graph it. I take the right-hand side, which was 0, and I graph it. And the solution, then, is the intersection of those two graphs. It's the x value of those two graphs. So here we get 17. Now, the reason it shows me 17 twice in my work is because we call that a double root, meaning that we touch the x-axis at that spot and go up. Um, we call it being tangent to the x-axis. But usually, you, you've seen some of the questions that when you use the quadratic formula, you get two solutions. Right? You seen that? Well, that's because those two solutions, let's just go back to like 5x plus 6. The two solutions then for something like this, if I were to factor x squared minus 5x plus 6, the two solutions end up being 2 and 3. Okay, that's because we're asking that question. Um, where do we cross the line y equals 0? And then if there's a geometry concept to it or context to it, you have to then decide, well, okay, does two work or does three work or do they both work? Does that kind of make sense? So there's, there's, I think it's always good when we're doing the geometry to really understand what the, what the algebra is telling us as well. Um, and that, that, that again, I, you get to the AC, anybody taking the ACT in the future, in the near future? The ACT has, and, and I'm, you guys are sophomores, right? Okay, just a uh, heads up on this. The, the ACT costs about 60 bucks to take. Um, but performance on that, getting like a, between like, let's say a 24 and a 26, can be thousands of dollars for you in the long run, okay? Um, based on like FAFSA and all that kind of stuff with, with, uh, financing your, your college if you're going to go to college. Um, if that is your plan, I know you guys are probably not taking it because you know that the school offers it when you're a junior, correct? Okay. When you're a junior and you take it in March, okay, I think we take it here at the end of February, beginning of March as juniors, um, schools are already picking students for spots. Does that make sense? So a school has such a uh, – admissions requirement that says, hey, we've got, um, you know, let's say 300 spots that we can fill with maybe scholarships or we can give money to or whatever or we can admit. Um, if you wait till March of your junior year to take that test and you don't get the score that you need to fill that one of those spots that they accept you, then you have to take that test again. Does that make sense? Okay. And they only offer it so often that you might take it again maybe in uh, like June of between your, your junior and senior year. And maybe then you get the score that you wanted. But those spot, spots now may be filled. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I, I've always been of the belief that if you wait till your junior year when we give it, even though we give it and the state makes us give it, it it's probably beneficial for you to take it before you get to that point, okay? Um, it's only $60, and it can save you um, a lot of money by increasing your score from one point, two points, whatever. Um, but the reason I say that is there are questions on there, there are equations on there that you have never seen, okay? I have seniors taking that uh, ACT. Um, they're not taking it through school, but they're taking it um, on their own in the next go-around. And I think it's in April, like on a Saturday, they'll take it. There are still questions that they haven't seen, okay, because they're in my trig class, and like the last five questions are all trigonometry. Um, and we just haven't gotten to that point for them to see those yet. But they should still know how to solve them, and they know how to solve them, or at least get solutions, mobile choice, using this context. If there's equations on there, and I've never seen the equation, okay, if I gave you like an equation that says, 
Have you guys ever seen anything like this before? The word log. Have you ever seen, did you guys do logarithms last year? If I don't know how to do, like, let's say just the log of, like, x plus 3 uh, equals 5, okay? I don't know how to solve that. I have absolutely no idea, okay? Well, what I can do is I say y equals log of x plus 3 and y equals 5. And now all I've got to do is go find where those things intersect. Now it's going to be, because I know the algebra of it, it's, it's way out here. Okay. Getting closer. Ten, so five to the tenth. So you go out to that number. So that'll take us some time. I'm going to go out to that number. Um, but you could figure that out by looking at the graph. Does that make sense? Regardless of whether you know how to solve that equation or not, the logic that when we, saw, or when we are solving an equation, the x value of where the left-hand side crosses the right-hand side being your answer can help you navigate questions that you've never seen on that test. Um, so I, that's why I like to talk about this stuff the algebra when we're when we're dealing with the geometry. Um, are there other questions on there that you guys want to talk about? Nothing else. Everybody else got hundreds on everything else. There are no questions in factoring or anything like that that we have. Questions about taking square roots or anything like that. All right, what I want to do now with you then, if you have more questions over that, why don't you get a piece of paper out? I want you to draw that triangle real quick. If, if we're going to look at the leg being the geometric mean here, then we the way we verbalized it in the theorem or the corollary was that it's the geometric mean between the hypotenuse. So we were usually putting hypotenuse here, right? And then the part of the hypotenuse that's touching the leg that we used. Right now we got that reversed. Right here, this is the, the part of the hypotenuse touching the leg, and this is the whole hypotenuse, right? Is that okay, though? Why is that okay? Good. Because the next step is to cross multiply. And whether I multiply 6 times x plus 6 or x plus 6 times 6, I get the same thing, right? What property is that? Commutative property of multiplication. Okay, so when I cross multiply, I'll get 6x plus 36 equals... Do we know how to multiply radicals? 9 radical 36. Spot on. Okay. The way we multiply radicals, I'm going to write a generic rule here. I'm going to say A radical um, C. And then I'll say B radical D. Okay. I'm going to multiply those. What we do, what you do there, there um, to get 9 radical 36. Yeah, you, you you took the the three that was out there and the three that was out there, right? You took the outsides, which were A and B. Those are ultimately our coefficients of these radicals. When we got A, B. And then what would you get on the inside? C, D. Okay. Now, what happens is because we, we took, we got a product on the inside there, and we used... 
a composite number times a composite number gets us a larger composite number, chances are that will turn into a number in which there is a perfect square in, or a, a perfect square that divides it. Does that make sense? And in this case, it's actually a unique one in which the perfect square or that, that radicand is indeed a perfect square. Does that make sense? So what is 30, radical 36 the same as? Six. So I can rewrite this as nine times six, which now I've got six X plus 36. Nine times six is what, 54? And now I get six X is equal to, subtract 36 from both sides. Three eighteen, right? Does that give you X to be three? Okay, now the, the only reason that, so, so a lot of times when I multiply two radicals, like for instance, let's take two radical two times three radical six, okay? Six radical 18, right? Now, 18 is not a perfect square, but is there a perfect square that divides 18? What, what's that number? What divides 18? That's a perfect square. Nine, right? So can't 18 be rewritten as radical nine times radical two? Well, what's radical nine? Three, so we got six times three on the outside. So two radical three times three radical six is equal to 18 radical two. So all I'm, all I'm doing there is just demonstrating that algebraically, when you multiply two radicals, you don't always get a radicand that is a perfect square. But a lot of times, I'm going to say every time, but a lot of times you get a radicand that needs to be simplified after you do their multiplication. I took the, the three, the three that was here on the inside times the six that was there on the inside. Um... Draw this picture, this one right here. Once you have it drawn, go ahead and um, start setting up your proportions. Don't, go, don't worry about solving them. Set them up, and then I want to go through the algebra with you. All right, so looking at Z, Z is a geometric mean, correct? Between what? One-third plus one-sixth, right? So geometric mean between the hypotenuse, because this is a leg. So hypotenuse there, and now one-third should go there, right? Okay, so just being deliberate, I'm not going to worry about Making that one number right now, we'll come back to that in a minute. X then is in altitude, so it goes there and there. Now here I would put one third and one sixth. Everybody okay with that one? I think that, that, that one to me is always the easiest one to figure out. Then the last one, Y is a leg, which is also in altitude. Now what should go here? One third plus one sixth, and what goes here? One sixth. Okay. So let's go ahead and solve these. But what, before I do anything, because I've got fractions inside fractions. Anybody know what a fraction inside a fraction is called? Um, what kind of word is bookshelf? Compound word. So it's called compound fraction. Okay, um, when we have compound fractions as kind of intermediate uh, procedures in a problem, we like to get those as compact as possible. So what we want to do is we want to add those together. 
Okay, so what do I need to add them together? Common denominator. So this is going to have to be multiplied by 2 over 2, right? So it's going to be 2 sixths, which 2 sixths is the same thing as 3 sixths, which is 1 half. So that's going to be 1 half. Is that going to be 1 half down here as well? Okay. So now when I cross multiply, I get z times z, which is z squared. And then how do I multiply fractions? Okay, so I get 1 over 6. So, so when I multiply fractions, I multiply 1 half times 1 third. Straight across the top gives you 1. Straight across the bottom gives you 6. That's how you multiply. I'm going to take square root of both sides. Square root of 1, 6. Okay. Now, this is much like what we talked about earlier. If, if we, going back to radicals, if I had like... Uh, Radical 3 times 9. Did we talk about how we could take that and say that it's radical 3 times radical 9? Okay. Well, multiplication and division are interlinked. So if I can separate a product into their own radicals, I should be able to separate a quotient into its own radicals. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the reason we could do that, and we'll get into it later on maybe if we have time, is laws of exponents. Laws of exponents allow for that. Okay. Um, what's the square root of 1? One? 1. Okay. Now, radical 6. Uh, careful. Because if I got 6, it goes down to 2 and 3. I'm looking for pairs, right? I'm looking for a perfect square that divides 6. It would just be 6. It would just be radical 6. It's already simplified. Now, here is a thing that we just commonly do. This is an accepted practice across all mathematics. You don't leave radicals in the denominator. Okay. Um, what kind of number is radical 6? Talked about it the other day. It's irrational. Okay. We don't like having irrational numbers in denominators. So what we refer to this process that I'm going to talk about is called rationalizing denominators. It's irrational right now. The procedure that we're going to go through says it rationalizes it, meaning it's going to turn it or conform it into a rational number. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we're going to do this through multiplication. Okay. What are you allowed to multiply a number by and not change its value? One, right? But if I multiply this thing by one over one, is that going to change the way it looks? No. It'll keep the value the same, but it won't change the way it looks. If I multiply by two over two, does that change the way it looks? Yeah, because the way we multiply radicals we multiply, or multiply fractions is straight across the top, straight across the bottom, right? So I multiply by 2 over 2, I get 2 over 2 root 6. Changes the way it looks, but I multiply by 2 over 2, which is just 1, right? So it changes the way it looks, but it doesn't change its amount. But that's still is a radical on the bottom, okay? The way you rationalize a denominator is you, you look at the radical that's down here, and you're going to multiply by that. Because what does that turn that radicand in the bottom into? To 36, right? Turns it into a perfect square. But now if I did that just on the bottom, then i got to do it to the top. Because now, by multiplying by radical 6 over radical 6, I've multiplied by what number? 1. Okay. So on top, it gives me now multiplying radicals. We talked about this earlier. Number on the outside times number on the outside. So just leaving radical 6. Okay? So it's kind of trivial. Like Some people say, well, what number on the outside, what number on the inside? If I've got 1, 1 can be rewritten this way. Does that make sense? Is that still 1? And then radical 6 can be written this way. And if I go number on the outside times number on the outside, 1 times 1 gives me that 1 right there. And then 1 times 6 gives me that 6 right there. Okay? So radical 6 on top. And what's the bottom turn into? Six. six. What kind of number is six? 
It's rational now, right? It terminates, okay? Um, so we have taken a denominator that was irrational and through multiplication by one, we change it to something that is rational. Is that okay? Now you can see that as you do enough of those, you might recognize that there are particular patterns that occur that would allow you to maybe skip over some of that multiplication, but that is the general way that you rationalize a denominator. Okay. Um, so what do we get? Let's do this bottom one. I get y squared is equal to 1 12th. So y will be radical 1 12th. Okay. Okay, so what you're doing, and I don't have a problem with this. Okay. So we, we took the fraction, 1 12, took square root, break it up into two fractions or two uh, radicals in the fraction. Square root of 1 is 1, right? Okay, now what Jagger's doing is he's just saying, I'm going to multiply by radical 12 and radical 12 right away. And that gives me radical 12 up top. And what's it give you on the bottom? Radical 144. Which that turns into 12, right? Now, if I type that in, it's going to tell me I'm not simplified yet. Why am I not simplified yet? So 12 is the same thing. Radical 12 is the same thing as 2 radical 3, correct? So now I have 2 radical 3 divided by 12. Okay, now, still not fully simplified. Okay, so we can, because we, there's a product here in the numerator, we can do a couple things. We can rewrite this as 12, or sorry, 2 over 12 times radical 3 over 1, or radical 3 over 12 times 2 over 1. Those are the options for what this is really saying. Does that make sense? Which one of those allows me to cancel? This one allows me to cancel? Well, if I look at just one fraction, can I cancel 2 and 12 with one another? They have a common number. They have a common factor, right? Three and, radical, three and radical, or radical 3 and 12 don't have a common factor. I, I, that, I, what, we, what we want to see here is every time... so. The reason I broke it this way is because we can cancel those numbers that are one being the outside and one being in the denominator. And it gives us 1 over 6. So you get 1 over 6, and I've got the radical 3 there. Okay? What I wanted you to see here when I, when I broke those apart, and I was seeing what you were doing there, Jagger, and that's fine. I want you to recognize that, would you guys agree that the 2, the 12, and the 3 all have common factors? Okay, but that 3 is stuck inside the radical. It's a symbol for something that is not 3. Does that make sense? So you can't cancel that with the 12 down there. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, remember those radicals are symbols. Therefore, we, we're not going to cancel them um, directly like that. Okay, so radical 3 over 6 would be the best way that we can answer that, that question. Okay, if you're a person that says... Um, you know, right here at that radical 12, you could have done this. I could have said, okay, radical 12 right here, that turns into 2 radical 3. What would I want? What was the radical part now of the denominator there? It's radical 3, isn't it? Okay, so what's 1 times radical 3? 1 radical 3, right? What's radical 3 times radical 3? Radical 9, but what's radical 9? Three. What's three times the two? That's there. Six. So you see, at the order of um, simplifying and the order of rationalizing are independent of one another. It doesn't matter the order that you do it. My suggestion, though, is to do what Jagger did to simplify at the end. And what you'll find out is a lot of your operations. If you wait to simplify at the end, a lot of simplification actually gets done on your way to the end. Okay. Um, 
No new homework. Okay. Um, I'm going to send you something tomorrow uh, for your um, e line or e learning day. Um, I'll send you it in an email, and I'll also post it to Schoology. All right. So, uh, have a great weekend. Thank you.